Again, Father, we thank you for another time in your presence. Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, you enable me to preach your word and give us understanding, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Deuteronomy 31, first verse there, it says, And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. So now Moses was handing over to Joshua. Moses was handing over to Joshua. And this was the formal and official, uh, sorry, the formal and unofficial ordination was done previously open to numbers numbers chapter 27 numbers 27 verse 15 so that uh, God was telling Moses that oh you're going to die you're not going to see the promised land and Moses goes on to tell God so God pick someone we need uh, Israel needs a man to lead them I'll pick up the story from verse 15 in numbers 27 verse 15 and Moses speak unto the Lord saying let the Lord the God of the spirit of all flesh set a man over the congregation which may go out before them and which may go in before them and which may lead them out and which may bring them in that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd and the Lord said unto Moses take thee Joshua the son of Nun a man in whom is the spirit and lay thine hand upon him so Joshua was ordained he was he had hands laid upon him and that was directed by God and look at verse 19 and he set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and gave him a charge in their sight and uh, and thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient and he shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord at his word shall they go out and at his word they shall come in both he and all the children of Israel with him even all the congregation and Moses did as the Lord commanded him and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded uh, by the hand of Moses so um, uh, Joshua, his hand, he was ordained, his hand was laid upon, but at this particular time, Moses is handing over to him. Moses is giving him full authority. Uh, there are many kings that their son became kings, or ordained kings, but they were ruling, co-ruling. So this time, Moses, God knew that, oh, sorry, God knew that Moses was going to die, so God told Moses, and Moses asked God, okay, pick a leader to lead Israel, and Joshua was chosen, Joshua had hands laid upon him, but Moses was still ruling at the end, until now that God is, uh, Moses appointing Joshua to take over. So this was kind of like a handover, and, Mo and Joshua would be in complete control. Look at verse 2, back to Deuteronomy 30. One. And he said unto them, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. I can I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord has said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. So as I said, uh, Moses handing over, but this day, he said, I'm 120 year, years old this day. It's, this particular day was not the birth of Moses. It was not the birthday of Moses. It's not that, oh, this is Moses' birthday, and, you know. <laughs> this is where people, uh, people misunderstand the Bible. People say there are errors in the Bible. Oh, is this day Moses' birthday? And maybe another day was Moses' birthday. I, too, I am 37 years old this day. Where am I present? See, it's not my birthday, but I'm 37 years old this day. So he just said this day. He, just, he didn't say, oh, this month and particular day. So don't take things, you know, out of context in what the Bible is saying. So Moses was 120, 120 years old, and Moses could not continue his duties as was required of him. So he was, not that he was bedridden, obviously he was still able to walk around and move around. The Bible says that his physical force had, uh, was not abated. So he was still strong, and his eyes were not even dim, right? So it reminds me of Isaac. Open to Genesis, Genesis 27, verse 41. Isaac. Isaac and Rebecca. Remember, Isaac, his eyes were dim. Isaac thought he was going to die, or at least his death was very close. So he decided to bless his sons. And even Esau, even his children were expecting him to die. In, in Genesis 24, verse 41, you know, after Jacob deceived Esau and Esau was planning to kill Jacob, he decided to wait until his father dies, then he'll kill Jacob. Because he thought that his father was going to die soon. So in that verse, in verse 41, it says, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. So he was thinking, Oh, my father is about to die. He was really mad at Jacob. 
But <laughs> at the end, uh, Jacob, uh, sorry, Esau lived, not Esau, Isaac lived for an additional 15 years at a minimum. So because Jacob uh, uh, and Esau, they met, they, they came together, they were now okay with each other, and uh, Isaac was still alive. So Moses was sure, though, that he was going to die because God told him that this is time that thou must die. And he has already pleaded with God in, in the past. You know, he asked him the first time, asked him the second time, and God said he shouldn't ask him again. So he knew he was going to die and because Israel was about to go to the promised land. So verse 3, The Lord thy God, he will, go he will go over before thee, and he will destroy these nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess them, and Joshua, he shall go over before thee as the Lord had said. So Moses is talking to all of Israel. So God will go before Israel. Joshua will follow the Lord and Israel will follow Joshua. You see how he said it. So God is going before Joshua is the one leading, is going before Israel and Israel is going, is following Joshua. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, the Bible says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That was Paul talking. So follow me as I'm following Christ. You're, you're looking ahead, you're making sure he's in line. So the Israelites, they all had the laws of Moses. They all know what is right, what is wrong. And Bible says don't go to the left hand or to the right hand. So that was their constitution. But they will be held accountable if they are led into sin. They cannot just, oh, it, it's what Joshua said we should do. No. God is going before. Joshua is following. And you're following Joshua. But you're following Joshua as he, that's talking to Israel. The Israelites are following Joshua as he followed the Lord. So uh, they are not to follow Joshua blindly. They are still to use the laws uh, that God had provided for them. And this is one of the reasons why God did not intend for them to have kings. God is their king. Because what you are supposed to fear the king. You are supposed to obey the king. So as a, if you are a judge, it is easy to depose a judge. It is easy not to follow what the judge says. Because the judge does not have you know, soldiers next to him. Uh, like uh, uh, barracks of soldiers. What they call it? Chariots of men. Uh, you know, cities of soldiers like kings have. So, um, and the kings can take men and their work, their duty is being a soldier. As opposed to in the time of judges, everyone does their business, then if there's a war, then they come and fight the war. And if you're afraid, you stay home. But as a king, the king says, okay, now soldier, it's time to go to war. <laughs> if you're afraid, you're a soldier. That is your job. And their, their job also is to defend him. So whatever the king says, goes. So, uh, so that's why God wanted them to have judges so that they follow the judge as he follows God. So if the judge is going the wrong way, and God will test them. God will prove them. You see, prophets will come, and if they lead you the wrong way, you're supposed to uh, go the right way. You're not supposed to follow them. You're not supposed to be led into sin. Because you have the word of God. In the previous chapter, I said it's not too far from you. It's not in heaven that you say who will go to heaven. Or across the seas, I say who will get it. The word is in your mouth. It's in your heart. It's right there. All right. Um, and the Lord, and the Bible says, as the Lord had said, right? So Joshua was God's choice. Let's go back to that verse. It says, and the Lord thy God, he will go over before thee, and he will destroy these nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess them, and Joshua he shall go over before thee, as the Lord had said. So Joshua was God's choice. And how do we know God's choice today? How do we know who is to lead? Uh, God wrote it down in the word in, in the Bible in First Timothy chapter three. The qualifications of a bishop, qualifications of a deacon. So we have the mind of Christ. That's what we have the mind of Christ exactly. So God has made to, made known His will to us. Oh, what is God's will concerning my marriage? What is God's will concerning my job? What is God's will concerning church? What is God's will? We have the mind of Christ. We have the will of God. It's written down as, as the Bible. So at this time, God chose Joshua, right? And now we know who God chooses if a man desires for that office. Then you say, okay, God obviously not choose you, but God has chosen you at this time. Okay, so we have the mind of Christ and we have to follow God's choice, God's own way, not a man to come up with his own way. Look at verse 4. Let's move on. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sihon and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. So 
they fought Sihon and Og, that is the kings, King Sihon and King Og, um, uh, the king of the Amorites, they fought them right before this time on this side of Jordan. So those battles were to build their faith. Those battles were to help Israel. Even Og was a giant. So you know, in Jericho, they were told, oh, there are giants there. Well, like grasshoppers, you know, exaggerating. But there were giants there, you know, great men, uh, hardened warriors. So these battles, you know, God can give us battles to prepare us for what is to come. And that's what he did for them. God hardened the hearts of these kings to fight against Israel. Uh, so when they were fighting them, as I said, on this side of Jordan, it encouraged the Israelites because you are not afraid that all Canaanites to come and fight them because they had the Jordan River, you know, behind, <laughs> at least separating them from the land of Canaan and all the places they were supposed to possess. So it gave them encouragement. They can fight these kings. They can possess the land and uh, they can enjoy the spoil of victory. They were enjoying the spoil of victory at this point. They were living in their land, living in, they, they, they had their cattle and had their, their houses houses, all of that, their vineyards, all prepared for them. Why is this important? Because God encourages us with rewards. When, he, when you're working for God, God is blessing you and is encouraging you so that you can do even more. Right? So, and you think about it. If you want to train a dog, the most effective and efficient way of training a dog is by rewarding the dog. Like the dog does what you say <laughs> and you reward him. So, that's what God does for us. He, he encourages us with rewards here on this earth. Right? On this, on this side of rapture. Now, with these kings, this new generation of Israel were battle tested. Because this new generation, they had to possess their possessions. They had a lot of battles to fight, as you see in the book of Joshua. They were battle tested, and God is basically saying, what you did to the, those kings is exactly what you're going to do to the rest of the Canaanites. No matter who they are, no matter what comes against you, remember what you did to those kings, how you possessed their land and possessed all their stuff, is what you're going to do to, to the Canaanites. He was encouraging them, as I said. Because if you're faithful with a little, you'll be faithful with much, right? So that's kind of um, mentality that God was giving them. Look at verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid for, of them, for the Lord thy God, he, he it is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. I mean, what more can God say? What more should God do? God has done miracles before them. He had done the wonders in Egypt. He has kept them in the wilderness. He said that many times. Uh, he helped them fight the battle of, uh, against Sihon and Og. I mean, he, he said, I mean, kept them in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. He has done everything everything. What more can he do? He said, I'll go before you. I'll destroy those nations. All you have to do is basically show up. And they showed up in Jericho, and God did, I mean, uh, fell the, made the world fall flat, as the Bible says. So, these are the same things God has told us today, right? He has told us, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So, God is with us. He will not forsake you. He will not leave you. He's fighting for you. You are more than conquerors. We are victorious. I mean, we are overcomers. If God be for you, who can be against you? I mean, God has told us the same things. Now we read the story of these guys, and we look into Joshua because we have the word of God. We look into the book of Joshua, and we can see how they were victorious in their battle. Because they trusted in God. They did everything God said. No matter what came before them. I mean, kings ganged up against them, and they were still victorious. So, we should have that faith concerning our own lives. No matter who gangs up against us, no matter who rises against us, no matter what is before us, no matter how high the wall is of Jericho, no matter if the Jordan River is, uh, is in your way, God says, I am with you. So, let us have the same encouragement, seeing where these people were and how God took them, how they possessed their possessions, what God gave to them. And, you know, practice that in our own lives and have faith. Look at verse 7. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, and the Lord said, He it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. So what daunting task is before you, especially preventing you from living a uh, victorious Christian life. What daunting task is before you? I mean, God told Israel the same thing. He told Joshua the same thing. A victorious Christian life is 
going to Canaan. It's a promised land, right? They were all, they were saved. They were believers. So, but they had to enter Canaan. And God is saying, "I'm with you. I'm strong. I, I, uh, be strong, right?" Uh, believe the word of God and you'll be established. Believe the prophet, uh, the prophet of God, and you'll prosper. That's what the Bible says. So you want to prosper. Uh, uh, follow the word of God. Believe Him. Trust in Him. Put all your faith in Him. Uh, the, in, sorry, in the word of God. That's what I mean. <laughs> Put all your faith in, in God. Put all, uh, believe His word. And God says, I'll be with you. As I said, there's so much, there's nothing else God can do. I mean, what else can he do to prove uh, that he's God? To prove that there's nothing impossible for him. So, is, that, is it time for your family that you're looking for? Time to serve the Lord? Time to, uh, to serve the Lord? Time to spend time with your family, I should say? And uh, get a good paying job so that you can do what God wants you to do here on earth and you can be prosperous and have time for yourself also? God can do it for you. You just have to ask God and believe that God is with you. You know, go forth, cross the Jordan, go into that promised land to live that victorious Christian life. Not a life that you'll be regretting or a life that you don't have time to spend uh, to serve God, to do what God wants you to do for your family, all of that. It might seem impossible, but that must have been how Israel felt. But they believed God and it came to pass in their lives. So God will never fail us. The problem is that we will fail Him. That's where the problem is. It's not that God will fail us or His word will fail us. So it is that we will fail Him. So examine yourself. It's, it's, all, it's all about, look, look at yourself. Look in the mirror, look at yourself, examine yourselves daily, die to flesh daily, and try to live in the Spirit. Look at verse 9. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. So not everyone was literate. Not everyone could read and write. So the priests, the elders, they had the duty of reading the laws to the people. They had to read the laws to them. And children hear and understand before they are literate. So they, you don't have to be literate to understand the laws of God, to hear the laws of God, because literacy is not a prerequisite to obedience. You say, oh, but I don't know how to read and write, so I don't have to obey the word of God. So that was not an excuse for them. They had the words of God. They are the elders, the priests, they were supposed to read the laws, the priests to read it during the services. The elders at the gates, you know, the families there, uh, they had to read the laws to them. So now as New Testament believers though, literacy is a requirement. I mean, how many times did Jesus ask people about their reading? How readers thou? Have you read it in the Word? Yeah. So, reading is a requirement. You're supposed to read, know how to read. It, it, if you don't know how to read, I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions out there. But in this day and age, if you don't know how to read, then it might be a sign of laziness. Because it's very easy in this day and age to learn how to read and to learn how to write. So you should be able to read the Word of God. To whom much is given? There's so much technology out there. I believe it's a blessing of the Lord also. But to whom much is given, much is required. So, And even if you don't know how to read, which it should be very rare, especially in America anyway. Even if you don't know how to read, buy a CD, buy the MP3 player or of, the, of the Bible and listen to it. Now, listening to the Bible though, it should be more like a supplement, like a you know, vitamin supplement or something, than your food. You should read the Word of God. Because I can't explain it perfectly, but reading has, you know, does so much more than you just listening to it. So you should read the Word of God. God requires that of us. But you can listen to it also, but take it as a supplement. And the supplement is not equal to the food. It's not. So if you really want to have all your vitamins and everything, find the vegetables that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that gives those vitamins and the fruits and take those the, the vegetables. Take in artificial made uh, supplements. Anyway, I don't want to digress, but they could be harmful because they just you know, flood your body with different uh, artificially made stuff and it can affect you. So the best thing to do is find where you're lacking. In fact, I'm digressing now. <laughs> but find where you're lacking. You know, if I'm lacking vitamin uh, B3 or K or something, then take the supplement of that particular vitamin. So, you know, target something and focus on it. Not just, oh, I just blast the Bible and I'm just listening. It's just, it's covering everything. You zone in, zone out, and in your mind you've read the Bible. No, you, you don't have the, in fact, it'll be affecting you because you think you've read it and you've not read it. And when, when you start seeing things in the Bible, you're like, how is that there? Because you didn't read it, you were just listening and you were zoning out. Anyway, let's move on. 
So, uh, speaking of which, though, when I'm old, God willing, very old, that reading is a burden, I'll get my kids, sorry, my kids' kids, <laughs> and or my kids' kids' kids, who knows, because for me to be very old, I read, when I say reading is a burden, not that I don't want to read, or I don't have time. Maybe seeing you know, can be difficult, who knows. I'll get my kids' kids to read for me, my grandchildren, they will read the Bible for me, so I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone there, yeah, I'm making sure they understand the Bible, <laughs> and you know, I'm spending time with them, and and they are reading the Bible for me. So they're like, what does this mean, Daddy? I'm like, oh, they, I don't know what they'll call me anyway. Oh, what does that mean then? I'll explain it. So that's that's my way of doing that. Anyway, now they know. They're going to be like, huh. All right. <laughs> also, we are all priests, New Testament believers, right? Who did Moses give, uh, give these laws to? To the priests and to the elders. We are all priests. So it's required of us to know the word of God, to read the word of God, right? He said, oh, it's just for the priest. Oh, you're a priest. You stand in the gap for the world. You see, you should always be ready at any time you're called to defend the faith, to contend for the faith, to give a reason of what, what you believe, right? So read the word. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman and needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen? Amen. All right, verse 10. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God, in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. So, yes, the whole law is read at that time. Uh, and I believe it's just the laws in Deuteronomy. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's from Exodus, who knows. But this book that he wrote, he wrote all the laws at the end, and he gave it to them, open to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 8. Now it might appear, oh wow, how can they possibly read everything? That's because the attention span of today's day and age, we of today's day and age, have been drastically reduced. I mean, people cannot just sit and listen to reading for two hours <laughs> or one hour. You know, as I said, you're listening to it on CD player or something or MP3, you zone out. Because attention span, we have too many things flashing, too many distractions, things that just come and go, heightening our uh, our senses. So the Bible, yeah, as I said, if, if you are not, if you don't dedicate yourself to it, you know, intentionally, purposefully read the Bible, then it's going to be boring to you. You have to delight yourself in the things of God. This is not something your flesh wants to do, right? If not, you'll be reading the Bible. So it's something you have to discipline your flesh into. So our attention span drastically reduced because of the distractions in this world. And also for the Feast of Tabernacles, it lasts for seven days. So it's not that, oh, they have to read everything in that feast, that one day. It lasts for seven days. So they must have broken it down. For example, in Nehemiah, when the people gathered, the Bible says they read till midday, from morning till midday. I mean, it, it just says the time that they were reading the Bible. So that shows a very long time, you know, morning till midday. That's maybe six, four to six hours that they were reading. The Bible says, and all the people gathered, Nehemiah 8 verse 1, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So Ezra, Ezra was a priest. Which says in verse 2. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding, upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. I mean, I could keep reading, but when he opened the book, everyone stood up. So, <laughs> let's just assume that they were standing for all those hours that he was reading. I don't know if maybe they sat down after a few hours, I'm not sure. But when he opened the book, they all stood up. And he now explained to them, he had to teach them so they can understand the things in the book. So, Bible reading has always been a vital part of church service. You know, reading the Bible, because this is what God wants. He wants people to, the hearing of the word, especially for the children, so that they can learn. We're going to see that as we read, go on. And Jesus also preached long sermons. Paul preached till midnight. He was preaching a long sermon till midnight. Now, the person fell and came back up, and Paul healed, um, Paul healed him, or gave him back, uh, brought him back to life by the power of God, obviously. And Paul continued talking till daybreak. It's not like, okay, the sermon ended. Yeah, the sermon ended, but he kept on talking till daybreak. So people are still listening to him. 
So there are long sermons in the Bible, long Bible readings. We should dedicate time for the Lord, for reading the Bible, for listening to sermons, things like that. Look at verse 12. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear, and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as ye live in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. So, first off, it's... And maybe I had not pointed this thing out. Anytime he's talking about the strangers, most of the time when he's saying the strangers, he's talking about your servants. Whether you capture them in war or you know, or servants that you bought, but it is your servants. Because a cost for Israel is that the stranger, you know, would be greater than the citizens themselves. So that means the servants that you hired or that you bought, they'll probably come out of, of that uh, bondage or that servanthood, and now prosper more than be the head and not the, and not the tail in the community. So it's not about the strangers. So the people serving, the people working, everybody, you can't just say, oh, it's just the children of Israel. It's just, you know, those are not servants. Those are not workers that uh, will listen to the, the Bible reading or listen to the sermon. It's everybody. Everybody listens. Everybody working. Time to read the Bible. Time to hear the word of God. Everybody should listen and should pay attention. That's what God requires. Then, more so for the children also, to learn to fear the Lord your God. He wants the children to learn to fear. For, for the adults, so that they can fear God. For the children, they can start learning to fear God. You see that? And it's, and it's talking about to their generations. So, uh, with a generation that rises up and does not know God, what does that say? How does that happen? What does that say about the previous generation? Because they didn't do this. They didn't teach the children to learn to fear the Lord God, the Lord their God. They didn't do that. Because if they are reading the Bible and, uh, or reading the laws to them, reading the laws to them, they would fear God. Because they would have been warned of all the, uh, the curses that will come upon them if they don't obey the Lord their God, if they don't keep all the commandments and do all the sacrifices and all of that. Or if, and if they start serving false gods. They should be afraid of God. So that means they did not learn to fear God. So either they didn't read the Bible to them or they did not read the Bibles enough. Right? They didn't put it in front of them day in and day out. And they're going in and coming out, all of that. So, reading to the hearing of your children to help them understand the Bible. Read to them. Let your children hear. I'm talking about right now. You know, read. Let's read to our children so that they can hear and understand. And start betimes. Start very early. It's quite difficult uh, to finish the Bible for the very first time. Everyone knows that. Everyone has finished the Bible once, at, at, at least knows that. Oh, it's difficult to finish the Bible that very first time. But it becomes easier after that. It, because you've encouraged yourself that you finished it. How much more for children? If you start reading to them before they can even read and write, before they are literate, you're reading the Bible to them, before they can fully understand all the words, or even pronounce all the words in the Bible. When they, when they read the Bible, or when during the time they are reading the Bible for the very first time, it will be easier for them. Why? Because they've heard it all. So reading it is exciting that now they can read it to themselves. It's not just that they are hearing it. And I'm talking out of experience. You know, it's, it's easier for them. They, 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 they can go through Ezekiel. They can go through the Psalms. They can go through all the laws. And because they've gone through it already. You've read it to them already so they know it can finish. <laughs> I'm saying this because I'm, remember, if you can think back, the first time you read the whole Bible, I mean, just going through the laws, and it, it was very difficult. So, and for children, it's very difficult. I mean, they skip Ezekiel, they skip, <laughs> like, have you finished? Uh, Ezekiel takes them forever. Uh, you, you're still in, oh, I finished two chapters, I finished one chapter, but other books, you know, the stories and Samuel and all of that, they are going through a bunch of chapters at, at one time. So it's be easier for them if you read it to them, read it to them multiple times before they start reading the Bible. So they will learn to fear God. It will be easier for them to serve God because they've heard it before. They know what to expect and they're looking forward to verifying what, you've, what they've heard you say. So it's the prove all things kind of attitude. You want, they are now in the mood of prove all things. Hold fast to that which is you know, true, which is good. Look at verse 14, Deuteronomy 31. And the Lord said unto Moses, 
Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in the pillar of the cloud. And the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. So this is kind of like the handover ceremony. And it is important. You know, what God was doing was important to help the faith of, uh, of the people, to encourage Joshua so that they can know clearly, okay, now Joshua is taking over and God is in this. So it, it was not just for show. It was to encourage people so they can follow Joshua and see that Moses and Joshua, uh, Moses is handing over to Joshua. Moses is in line with it too because they feared Moses and they were following Moses. Look at verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt see Sleep with thy fathers, and these people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and I, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? And I shall surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought in that, in that they have turned unto other gods. So God said, these people, right? Referring to the nation of Israel in their generations. He's not talking about this exact generation, right? When he says these people, because God is referring to Israel. Just Israel and generations, looking at all of them as, as a nation. So this particular generation, obviously, they kept the laws of God till the death of Joshua, till the death of all their elders during the time of Joshua. So they kept the laws of God. That, this was a very godly generation, a very righteous gen, uh, generation as a whole, I, I mean. So, so God knew that Israel Israel will break the covenant as a nation. And it, it was no shocking to him. So the dispensationalists say, oh, you know, God tried this, it failed. God tried this, it failed. Oh, God is like, ah, oh, it just keeps failing. No, God knew already. Even after he destroyed all uh, the, uh, the world the, uh, with the flood, he knew that evil, evil imagination is continuously in the heart of man. Always, continuously evil imaginations and sin. So he was... All this was just a plan. Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. The Bible clearly says that. So, hence, the law, this was our schoolmaster. This was to teach us and to bring us to Christ. To show us that we are sinners. To show us that, yes, truly, we have fallen. <laughs> all have sinned and come short of glory of God. So, the law is perfect. It's not, oh, God tried this and it failed. No, it's that man was, was the fault was found in man. So that's what that's the whole essence. That's what God was trying to show. That you cannot save yourself. You cannot do it by yourself. So the law was is perfect and therefore showing that we are not perfect. Right? That we need a savior and the law is the benchmark. Can you reach that? You say it's by works, you say it's by doing good, you say no, can you, this is what I call the benchmark. So God will rightfully punish them. Why? As a father would chastise, chastise a child, talking about the nation itself, so who chastise them, he'll punish them, because he had given them the laws, it was easy for them to follow, but they are still, as a nation, they, they went and served other gods. And he was very merciful. And his, his mercy extended for generations, in fact. It's not like, oh, as soon as the sin, he comes down hard. You know, he, he gives them problems, no rain, you know, little things here and there, just to bring them back until it gets to the point that they are, become, they are rejected, basically, as a nation. And he punishes them and re, uh, reserves the remnants uh, that have not bowed the knee to bow. All right, so look at verse 19. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles shall befall them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination which they go, ab go about, even now, before I have brought them into the land which I swear. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. So, 
God is saying it over and over again. These guys, they are sinners. These guys are going to break the law. That is who man is. So God is showing us that... It, it, Obviously, you know at the end from the beginning. God is showing us that he knows man. God is telling Moses exactly why he's saying all this. Why he needs to teach these laws. And this shows us the power of music. Don't underestimate the power of music. The message of the words get drilled into your subconscious. You don't even know it. I mean, there are songs since I was a child that I remember. Uh, there are songs in my Pentecostal days that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> quite vividly actually so the power of music it is that powerful be careful what you listen to that this is why the devil uses it uh, significant it's a very significant tool in the hands of the devil the, he understands it from the Word of God in fact he was a music guy in fact he, he was a music person he has trumpets and every instrument not every a bunch of instruments of music in his body he was built that way so the devil knows the power of music and he uses it look at the celebrities look at people that very influential they are music artists worldly music artists so um, don't underestimate that and be careful of what you listen to in fact not just be cautious use it as the offensive fill your mind with music sing the psalms sing spiritual songs amen so you know the power of it then use it don't just be afraid oh I know the power of it so I don't want it to affect me no use it amen just like the sword right the sword is a, can be a defensive weapon and an offensive weapon so use the sword use the word of God now it says put it in their mouth right Bible always commands us to sing it's not oh put it in their ears you see, didn't Thomas just put it in their ears? He said, put it in their mouths. <laughs> right? Listening is not sin, though. But the Bible always commands that you should sing. Sing it. Put it in your mouth. Because putting it in your mouth helps the melody and the lyrics to become a part of you. Right? So, listening, listen to it, you probably just get the melody. But when you start singing it, put it in your mouth, then it becomes a part of you. So, God must have given Moses the melody also. Because he taught them the song in that very day. So when you say song, he didn't say he taught them the words of the song that very day. He taught them the song. And the, the song is long. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 32. You can look at your Bible and see how long this song is. That's the whole song. So he taught them the song. So song entails lyrics and melody. That's the definition of song. So for him to teach them, teach it to them that day, I mean, Moses is not Beethoven or something, or maybe, I don't know. Let me know. I don't know about his music skills. But when God tells him to do something, build it, build the ark, build that, build that, God gives him all these laws and he gets somebody to do it, like fills somebody with spirit to do it. So it's not like Moses is a jack of all trades, right? Um, so, but God must have taught him the, the, the melody of the song. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, isn't that something? For God to teach you the melody of a song. So this is like God composed it. If there's any song that God composes, this, I mean, this is it. The Psalms, they composed it. Yes, inspired by the, uh, by the Holy Spirit, right? But they composed it. I believe God used their talent. You know, David was a psalmist, you know, his music, all of that. So God used their talent. But it looks like, I mean, Moses, <laughs> there's no, you don't read the Bible, I'm like, oh, wow, Moses could sing. <laughs> so I'm not seeing that. And in one day, so it must be spiritual. It, it, uh, sorry, it must be from God. And to teach all Israel. It's one thing that he learned it one day. It's another thing that he taught all of them in that very day. <laughs> so I believe it's one day. So God taught them the, uh, the, the melody. It came from the Lord. Now you say, ah, but we've lost the melody. How can we sing this song? This is something that God taught them. This shows us that the melody is not the most important. It is the words, right? The melody only makes us remember the words. That's what the melody is. It's important, but it's not the most important. And it's not that the melody cannot be changed. God promised to preserve his words, not the melody of the Psalms. <laughs> Say, oh, I'm going to preserve all the melody of how David wrote Psalm 23 and all of that, all the Psalms. He didn't promise that. He promised to preserve the words. You can add a melody to it to help you remember it. Make it easy for yourself. And people are doing it. There are, there are churches that are doing that. Add a melody to the Psalms and all of that. Make it easy for yourself to remember it so that you can sing it. The point is the words. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was God. It is the word that is most uh, that is important. Uh, most important. Not the melody. But it has been something to have the melody. You know, sing it how God taught the Israelites to sing it. 
So let's be creative. God wants us to be creative. You know, put in the mouth is there. All right, verse 23. And he gave Joshua, the son of Nun, a charge and said, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. So this was Joshua's goal in life. From the introduction of Joshua in Exodus, he was fighting battles. <laughs> Joshua appeared <laughs> in the Bible to lead the armies of Israel in the wilderness uh, to fight the battles. You know, the Amalekites came to attack them and all of that. So Joshua was fighting battles. All that's his whole life. <laughs> you know, fighting battles. So this was Joshua's goal in life, and that was his charge. That was his purpose. And we also have a charge as New Testament believers. Right? We have a charge, and it is the Great Commission. You know, as a church, it is a great commission. Now, as individuals, you are to be part of a church. Right? And God made it very clear to us in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. And all things are of God, who had reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and had given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You see that? So that is our own charge, to reconcile the world to God. Right? He has given us the tool to, to do that. That is through the church. He's given prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, uh, to help to edify the church, to exhort the church, to, so that the church can do the work, the Great Commission. Amen? So be part of the church. That is the commission. That is our charge. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, you cannot go and get married. <laughs> you know, Paul says, hey, if you, if you can be single, that's fine. I mean, even better, right? So, but you have other things to do in life. But this is your charge. You have to understand what the main, what, what the important thing is, what the priority is. So that at the end, like in the end of Joshua, you may be like, oh, there's still more you could have done. <laughs> you know? So you don't want to regret at the end. Because if not, you have your life full of hay and stubble and chaff, and they'll all be blown out. They'll all be burnt, sorry. They'll all be burnt in the fire. So you want to do what has eternal value, which is the charge that God has given us. Look at verse 24. And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee, for I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? I like this passage because for those people that think that hard preaching doesn't work, here you go. It worked. I mean, Moses preached hard against these guys. Moses was rebuking them, saying, "Oh, I know what you, what you, how you guys do, uh, you know." So, what Moses said to this generation helped them stay right. This was the one generation, right, that they stayed right. <laughs> until Joshua died because they were afraid. They, they were preaching hard. Hey, this is the one, and this is the one. So they got hard preaching from Joshua. I mean, Joshua is like, who do you choose to serve? You know, you want to serve the gods of your fathers, of the, you know, or me and my family, we shall, I, as for me and my family, we shall serve the Lord. So this is hard preaching I was, they were giving them, warning them about destruction that will come their way if they want to serve false gods. So many believers, they get saved and they continue to live as the world lives. They're still saved, but they didn't get hard preaching. Hard preaching lets them know what they are. <laughs> right? That's what hard preaching does. You know, fire breathing preaching. I like that. I like the fire breathing conference that's coming up. Fire breathing. Because, you know, it's like that same fire that will come and that will burn the, the, the hay and there's the shaft and all of that. So, they need to leave the precious metals. You see what you are. You see what you are made of. Right? The fire shows them who they are. Uh, and then they make the choice to live for God or not to live for God. So, the hard preaching helps them, helps people to live for God. Right? Some people might decide to leave the church because of that. Because now they've seen who they are and they, they, don't, they cannot stand that kind of preaching. They, cannot, they don't want to leave that kind of life. Because they don't believe the word of God. Right? So, 
preaching against the, uh, or preaching explaining the roles of men and women, you know, which affects dressing, which affects you know going to work, staying at home for the women. I mean, when you're preaching the things that are in the Bible, people, you know, people see where they stand. They see what they believe. They they now go to the Bible and they want to make excuses for themselves, or at least they know where they stand and they know, okay, I'm living in sin, as opposed to oh, just everything is fine. You know, have faith, have faith, just believe God will do it. <laughs> you know, if that's all you're listening to and you're not, it's not pointing on sins like fornication. Talking about hard work versus laziness. Talking about reasons to get married, the case for marriage. Talking about alcohol. You know, different things like that. Preaching about soul winning. If if um, if you listen to preaching like that and you know, okay, I'm not doing what God called me to do then that will help you to choose the right way. See, I presented before you, before you uh, death, uh, life and death. Choose life. So, but if you don't present the life and death, and all you're presenting is, oh, don't worry, it's just life, 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 then, and they're in the death, <laughs> they'll, they'll die. And when I'm saying life and death, it's not about eternal life, it's about living on this earth. High preaching corrects your life. You know, staying right is easier than getting right. So that's what high preaching helps to do. Open to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Now, some people, as I said, will decide to leave the church. So be it. Look at what the Bible says. In Luke chapter 10, I read verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. So, God is saying, as a church, you should pray for laborers. God wants laborers in his church. People that are ready to serve. People that are ready to work for God. They are ready to correct themselves. See, anyone that puts his hand on the, uh, on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That's what you want. So, hard preaching helps to get that. To, you know, it, it sets them life and death. Are you going to be a gatherer? Are you going to be a scatterer? You know, you're scattering. So, and the Bible says, hey, you are among wolves. And you're like lambs, uh, sheep among wolves. So, what is the wolf going to get? The, the, uh, the weak in the herd. So that's what happens. So you want to strengthen the sheep. You want to make sure you know, they are not hurting. They are not following the ways of this world. Because you go, out, you, you go outside the path, you find yourself in the jungle, and the wolf will get you. Outside the park, outside the herd. So one laborers want a strong herd. And laborers, I'm talking about uh, uh, um, people serving the Lord. The church is for serving God. That's what the church is for. You want to do the work of God here on earth? That's what the church is for. God says, pray ye uh, for laborers, right? All right, verse 28. Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves, and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song, until they were ended. So he says, an evil will before you in the latter days. Why is he saying, why is he telling them this? Because he wants them to continue to pass this down to their children. Evil will before you in the latter days. So let it not be your generation. Let it not be your generation. Let it not be your generation. That's what's supposed to be passing down to your children. So again, Moses was right because God told him that that's what's going to happen. So Moses was, was just telling them what God said will happen. Because God told him. See, after all these laws I've given them, they're still going to sin. They're still going to go and serve other gods. I mean, Moses is telling them the same thing and he was sure about it. So you can give judgment, you can say things when you know the Bible says so. When you know the word of God says so. And that, that is you know, where hard preaching, that's where preaching comes into play. And Moses could also testify that it was true. Moses is one of the lucky people that lived um, for, for another generation because there was one generation, they all passed away after 40 years in the wilderness, and he was in this new generation. So he has seen man. In fact, he dealt with man in Egypt. He ran, he left there. He went uh, uh, um, and stayed uh, uh, Median. Anyway, he went and stayed somewhere else after he ran away from Egypt for another 40 years. So Moses was 80 years old when he came back to save Israel right from Egypt. So Moses has lived long. Now he's 120. <laughs> so now 40 years. So Moses has lived long. He knows how man uh, how, how man is basically. And he knows man is wants to sin. Man is rebellious. And as I kept telling them, even while I was with you, you're rebellious. How much more when I've left? 
because they feared Moses and he knew that because obviously the water, his head was glowing at one time <laughs> and anybody that opposes Moses is either the floor opens up or they get leprosy <laughs> so what do you fear that guy <laughs> so he's like if you're still rebellious with me here when I die I mean it's going to be so much more <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be so much more rebellious because who are you afraid of so and that's what happened and God told him that's what will happen all right so that's chapter 31 we'll do chapter 32 next week the song of Moses Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you again for teaching us and warning us and encouraging us. I pray, O oh Lord, that you help us heed these warnings, help us to understand uh, what you have for us, the plans, the, the goodwill you have for us, uh, life on one hand, death on another. Let us choose life, O oh Lord. Um, help us not to make the mistakes that this genera uh, the, the generation of the Israelites made, not teaching their children. Help us all to pass down this, the fear of you to our children, to the next generation. Uh, and help us to do your work, O oh Lord. Thank you for all that you do for us as a church. Pray continue to bless the works of our hands. Make us laborers in this place. Let us serve you with all our hearts, O oh Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.